Okay, let's resume. Today we are finishing up chapter four, viewing and navigation. And we finished up anchor yesterday and uh, we're gonna go to billboard and then collision. But as we uh, finish anchor, let's revisit the scene that gave us a little trouble yesterday. Uh, clicking on that orange text to launch the website. When we go to the anchor scene right here and we check the anchor sure enough it works or it looks like it works all of the right parameters are in there and we recheck the system we see ah yes uh, plug in the network cord to make sure it can reach the web pull up a web page that's something we didn't have yesterday. And then I launched uh, an external browser to confirm this. So today, today we'll test Octaga, Octaga browser, and here it is. And when I click on that text, first you notice that when the cursor moves over the text, it changes, indicating uh, not only did it go from a, a crosshair to a finger point, but there's a little if you can see it there, it's got a little URL. It'll be interesting actually to see if this cursor comes through on the video because sometimes uh, cursors aren't picked up. There's some curiosity of the operating system that we don't see that. But in any case, Octaga shows a cursor with a hand that says URL next to it. And then uh, when we click there, it launches the site. And there it is, the uh, Kelp Forest site to learn more about what what is that thing? What does it do? We can also see by moving our cursor around that we can get it to change from the crosshair to the finger even when we're not directly over the text. And recall why that is. It's because we put a transparent box around the text. So it's invisible, but it is geometry and therefore sensible and clickable. And that makes it much easier for the user to to get there instead of going well here it is on here oh ooh, it's off ooh, ooh, it's on again that can be very uh, difficult sometimes it uh, it sort of reminds me of uh, now this now this this one's old even by my standards but uh, uh, Abbott and Costello did it, any of you ever watch the old Abbott and Costello movies yeah okay so uh, 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 Luke Costello remember when he got engaged engaged to be married, and he, he got this beautiful en engagement ring for his fiance, And so he puts it on, and she's looking at it, and looking at it, and, you know, where's the, where's the stone? And he, oh, oh, yeah, and he pulls out this gigantic magnifying glass, and he's going, yeah, here it is, here it is, whoa, whoa, whoa back, back, little, yep, yep, yeah, there, yeah, right, see it, see it? Well, you know, you might want to check out that movie, but in any case, I'm always reminded of that when you're trying to click on text. It's, it's very hard by itself, so this is a good trick. Okay, so there's Anchor. And, oh, by the way, we, we just added the World Wide Web to X3D. Pretty cool, huh? Okay, so now, and now you guys are full-fledged web authors in 3D. That's a nice, uh, nice achievement. So let's go on ahead to uh, see if I can click the right thing here. Let's go on ahead to Billboard. Okay. So Billboard. So yet another grouping node. Oh, we know about grouping nodes. They collect things together. And sometimes they act upon their children nodes. So in this case, the Billboard node says, we want any geometry to face the user. Wherever they go, wherever that camera is in moving in space around that fixed object, instead of the object staying fixed as we move around, the object will be, let's say we turn it this way, instead of it staying fixed like that, instead it follows me. It first rotates to face and then as I go around, it rotates to face wherever the viewpoint is. OK, 
Okay, so pretty cool. When do we use this? Well, we use it as a readability or a visibility thing. Sometimes you want the thing to face uh, the person just all the time. So it's, it's less like a, a picture on a wall with moving eyeballs and more like a sign that's rotating, but it doesn't just keep spinning in the circle. It will always rotate to face right where you're at, wherever the front of that geometry is. So we determine uh, how it rotates by a parameter called axis of rotation. And if we look at the defaults on that, 0, 1, 0, well, where would we expect that to be? Well, x, y, z, 0, 1, 0, that defines the y axis, a 1 in the y direction. Uh, oh, so y is up, y is the vertical direction. So therefore, if that's the axis of rotation, then our geometry is going to, by default, rotate about that vertical axis. Why? Oh, because that's our most common use case. As we drive around a world, we want it to be pointing at us on the plane. Okay? So this is maybe the sixth or seventh time in X3D that we've seen that, uh, yeah, you can put the coordinates anywhere you want, but you really want to keep Y in the vertical direction. Because if you don't, a lot of stuff just doesn't work properly, and you have to you have to struggle to make it work right. So, in the early days of Vermal, uh, when we were authoring, I mean, we we didn't appreciate just how important that was, and, and people were kind of laissez-faire, and they just put models with any old axis, and it got crazy trying to hook them together. So yes, we keep Y up. All right. So then, when would we change it? Well, you can change it clearly to another direction. Perhaps uh, uh, the sign is something you want them to read while they're going up the elevator. Okay, well in that case you probably want to rotate about the x-axis so that the sign tilted to face them as they went up or down. Uh, perhaps it's uh, some kind of a heads-up display or something that you're going to put below the user's camera situated in the same coordinate system, the same transform, but we put it down there and we want to tilt it up. And rather than figure out the exact perfect angle to rotate it, particularly if the user might get closer or farther away, instead of saying, oh, let's just put a billboard on that thing, rotate it about X axis, and then, and yeah, they can get close, they can get far away, it'll, it'll still be looking at. Okay? Uh, but that's not too frequent. There's actually another case that's more frequent, and that's when you're flying. When you're navigating freely in space up and down as well as left and right. And so if you want to maintain improved visibility then, you would use zero, zero, zero. But you go, hey, wait a second, that's not an axis, right? Zero, zero, zero is just the origin. It doesn't give you a vector pointing in any direction. Correct, it's not an axis, it's a special case that billboard will recognize and say, oh, I'm, you, you want omnidirectional rotation, so I will just always face you. And uh, uh, that's different than a regular rotation. If we did a SF single field rotation in a transform node, remember it's axis angle, X, Y, Z, and an angle. So if we have an axis of zero in that, rotate zero about that, it's undefined. The mathematical term would be degenerate. It's a nonsensical definition. So you would not use zero, zero, zero in a rotation value. You would not use it in the rotation of a viewpoint, for example. But in a billboard, because there is this special case of pre-rotation pointing toward the user, it's no longer ill-defined, but rather well-defined, and the behavior is, is repeatable. Okay, so, uh, well, before we get into the warnings, let's look at this darn thing. Okay, billboard. Uh, what's Dogbert doing today? It looks like he's uh, cooking the books. Okay. Have a nice day. So here's our scene.
let's use the, uh, the graph inspector a little bit here. Open up that scene. We'll look down. It's it's called the uh, the navigator. Actually, I double clicked on the top of that and brought it up, and uh, we can look now and see what's our billboard. Our billboard is linking the inline for the uh, introduction message of the kelp forest exhibit, and then past that we have a second billboard that's just loading the tank. Okay, so that's a pretty handy dandy uh, inspector feature there, which we could also get by looking just at uh, this. So, what's going on here? Looks like we have the tank. Looks like we're missing the text. Okay, so let's try it again elsewhere. Well, this does not bode well for my sick graph trip. I see what's wrong with what's making um, X3D, XJ3D complain. It doesn't like working with both .world files, meaning Verbal 97, and X3D files in the same thing, which personally I think is a flaw, but what does that matter what I think? Uh, it matters what it does. So uh, I think uh, what we've been doing is gradually stripping out a lot of these .world files. When you see them, you say, well, why would we need a Verbal link in an inline? for reliability. And the answer is we've been putting those in uh, for when we backwards translate to Verbal 97 for Verbal browsers so that it's uh, a little more reliable. So let's try it without, see if that helps at all. And let's try Octaga again this time. If you have 30 euros, you're welcome to buy this. I'll decline. Okay, so there's our text. There's our model, and if I drag and click out here, you can see we are navigating. Let's switch that navigation to examine mode. Okay, and now when I click and rotate, we see, oh, well, look at that. I can rotate around the scene, but the text is not there. Uh, excuse me, but the text is not rotating. The text is just sitting tight. Okay, so that's pretty cool. Uh, if we zoom out, we may see the text disappear completely. Nope. Okay. For now, I think what we have is uh, let's fiddle with this a little bit more. Oh good, yeah, we did make it, no, no, we didn't. Let's make it disappear. We have a something on here called, uh, that you could call a sort of a reverse LOD, where we make that sign text disappear if you get too close. So I'm a little too awkward today to get there. Maybe I can get a little closer. I'm using the, uh, the scroll wheel on my, on my uh, mouse to try to zoom close enough. If you drill down into that text scene, the introduction message, what we do is uh, if you're inside the kelp tank, you no longer want those big signs appearing all around you. It's kind of distracting from within. So what we did was we used a LOD in the reverse fashion to hide it so that uh, it wouldn't be available. But anyway, this is a nice uh, addition to that. Okay, so there, I made them disappear there. So it looks like we're right at the edge of the uh, disappearing range. And that may be the trouble that uh, XK3D has with it. Okay, so let's, uh, let's actually pull the string on it and go into that 
uh, introduction kelp message. Wow. And uh, that's in the, uh, the book examples. And it's in the one uh, directory that's not labeled after a chapter. It's just called Kelp Forest Exhibit. And that's where we keep all of it. So let's just go examine that file to make sure we're uh, all on the same page here. OK, so this looks pretty good. We have a navigation info. Notice it's kicking up the speed to 10 meters a second while you're out there so that it's a little more friendly when you zoom in or out on these things. Uh, we can also see there's an LOD here with a single range at 20 meters and the first entry is a world info. World info is simply uh, some info about the world so gee that doesn't draw. So you can think of it as a null node. So this is saying that inside of the LOD of 20 meters, we're not going to draw anything at all. And that's why it's disappearing. And that's why it's occasionally uh, hard to track. If we open up that LOD node and edit it, I think we'll find another uh, improvement. This file was translated way back in 2002. And, uh, since then, we've had a field added to LOD, and you may recall it from uh, the last chapter, and it's called uh, Force Transitions. So why don't we put that in there? So I typed in a little, hit control space. My machine is laboring for some reason. So let's clear some other processes out of here. doesn't want to play, it's hard for me to keep going. Well, let's give that a minute to wake up. Let's go back to the billboards. What I'm going to do to that is just add a force transitions equals true so that we make sure the LOD is switching exactly where we want. It might be that some of the browsers were over-optimizing and saying, well, I can get better performance if I switch to the first one which is nothing, the world info node, and that's what might be confusing things. So we'll, when it wakes back up, we'll try that. There's something here. Trying to use the code completion. No suggestions, okay. comes up. No joy. So we're going to kill that thing and we'll restart it. Okay, so back to billboard done. What are the hints and warnings? Well, first is, uh, this is less a warning as much as a, hey, look at this, this is a good thing. If you use def and use and copy it, you say, okay, maybe now I have three copies of my billboard, my warning sign, my picture, whatever it is. You might well be worried that if one is facing you, the other ones are parallel to that and just, just out of, uh, out of sync with the camera. But no, that's not the case. They should all face the user, even though the directions for some might be different than the others and their copies. So deaf and use works. Okay. Next uh, hint is uh, often when you're using a billboard, you've positioned something somewhere else. 
And uh, so you've got a chain of transform nodes. So don't put the billboard at the top. Because if you think of it, the transforms are sort of like a, a stair step of moving something out to another place. So when you put the billboard on that, then yes, it will rotate to face you, but about the axis of the billboard that might be three or four levels up in the hierarchy. So it's really rotating way out here. So it may still be facing you, but it will be off screen. It won't be in the direction you can see anymore. So if you have a series of transforms, always put the billboard last or maybe next to last so that the rotations are just there and not cycling about a coordinate system that is far, far away. Okay. Uh, that's a good exercise actually is to use some nested transforms and put a billboard and try it both ways. And then here's a definite warning in terms of don't do this. Okay, let's say you put a viewpoint under the billboard. Okay, let's, let's try to use that in a sentence, an active sentence to describe that behavior. Okay, the billboard will rotate whatever is under it to look at the viewpoint. Right, that's the definition of viewpoint, or excuse me, the definition of billboard. Okay, so we have a billboard, and we have a, we have a billboard, and we have a viewpoint that's looking at it. And now the billboard is saying, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rotate you, camera, to look at you. But every time it does that, the viewpoint itself is changing. So the billboard says, oh, wait a minute, I'm not done. I, I have to rotate again and again and again. And so this uh, uh, feedback loop erupts that is doing very bad things. How bad? Well, your mileage may vary. It depends on the browser. One thing we're careful not to do is uh, define illegal behavior. I should say, we don't define what's the proper illegal behavior. We just say, it's illegal. Don't do that. It's broken because it doesn't make sense. All right, if we spent time defining just what is the legal behavior, that would force browsers to try to emulate a certain broken thing and that could be very inefficient. So I can't tell you exactly what would happen, but I, I encourage you to try. I mean, it's, it's always fun to see how things break and then you can recognize it if you've seen, observed it in a testable condition, then if it happens to you later, you'll, you'll notice it. Okay, and there's our editor, and you see it couldn't be more simple for a billboard. It simply gives us uh, an axis of rotation, and uh, uh, of course our well-understood bounding box center and size. And here's some screenshots showing that example that we were just playing with. Okay, finally, the tool tips. So that should cover billboard. Let's see if X3D Edit is uh, ready to play again. We'll go look for our introduction message. No, that didn't survive. So I'll pull that up. And we'll see if we can't put force transitions in there this time. And maybe make that example not only workable, but a little more consistent among the different browsers who might be trying to over-optimize. Okay, so edit, LOD, there we go. Force transitions. Okay, a note for the minutes, please. Uh, Richard is uh, uh, check on force transitions which version it was in and consider adding it to the tooltips. Okay, since we modified it, I'm going to uh, add a meta tag. This is actually a good time to show you one or two other things. So let's add a meta tag. We have it translated and then we never revised it since then, didn't need to. But we're revising it today. So I just dragged and dropped in a meta tag and look for the
proper metadata term, which is, I thought was revised. Let's see here. Uh, modify. There we go. Not revised, but modified. And then we'll use today's date, 7 August 2008. Only two more modeling days before the Web 3D Symposium in Los Angeles. Okay, and then let's test this scene. Uh, we'll save it. And refresh. And let's see if we can't zoom in here. This is a tricky scene to test because the signs are intentionally above and below, very far. Try to restart again. Open her up a little bit. Maybe first seek on this. This will be interesting actually, if we click to seek it, what would you expect to happen? As we get close, it should disappear, right? So we'll see how close it takes us. I didn't like my seek. Okay, so we'll leave that testing for another time. Clearly know that this is the right thing to do, so I'm going to commit now commit this change to the uh, archive. And I'll put a little comment here why force transitions to help ensure more consistent browser behavior instead of subjective performance optimizations. Okay, back to the task, our next chapter. Collision note. Collision note is a helpful little note. It's good, but uh, frankly, we don't use it too much. But sometimes, uh, depending on your world, you might find it very helpful. So we talked earlier in navigation info, there were a couple of parameters in there under avatar size. And the avatar size parameter of interest for collision was collision distance, the, the first element of that three tuple array, and it defined how close could we get before we crashed into a wall. That's also the near frame of the near plane of the view, view frustrum. Okay, so collision node lets you turn that feature on or off. Okay, so it's a grouping node. It's like any other group or transform. It doesn't move it anywhere, it just sets that bit and says, this part's collidable, that part isn't. So for example, if we wanted that floating clickable sign right in the middle of the corridor that you're transiting down to get to the stairs at the end and look over the top, if the little floating billboard sign says, come down the corridor to see the beautiful top of the stairs, then we would put a collision false on top of that, just on top of that billboard so that we could go through it, navigate through it, and it wouldn't block the camera. But the walls would have collision true uh, uh, to work. And anybody who's reading carefully on the uh, pros here, is anybody reading carefully on the pros here? They both say the same thing, right? Enabled, true, and false. Ah, so that can't be right. So let's go to our good old tooltips and confirm what the right answer is. Extrude tooltips. Collision node.
Okay, so here we go, collision, enabled. This enables or disables collision. Okay, so that was pretty straightforward, just as we might expect. So let's fix the slide set. It said collision enabled equals true means it blocks. And therefore false allows the user to navigate through the geometry. Okay. Uh, very important warning on this guy is that uh, it's not used for object-to-object -object collision detection. We don't have that built in to most scenes. There is an advanced technique, some nodes that we can use to do that, but we're not going to do that kind of thing in this class. Okay, and then as a look ahead to uh, when do we, uh, uh, when we get to the events, this also has some events to support it. Collide time and is active. Those are reporting events. So if the user does come up to a wall and bounce against it, you have an event that you could use to trigger something else. So for example, it might pop up a sign or something that says, hey, don't bounce into the wall, turn around and go down the corridor like I told you to. That might not be the most effective user interface, but I hope, I hope you get the idea. You can take advantage of those things. Okay, so what else do we do? Uh, renewed emphasis here, yet another node that defend, depends on y-axis being up. So. If, if you use a different axis is up in your worlds, that's legal, but a lot of these nodes just won't work properly. So uh, I recommend don't go there. Okay. And then a point of information, we can consider that walk mode, when it's following terrain, letting you go up and down, that's actually another uh, form of collision detection because what it's doing is, is taking your camera and looking at the bottom of it, the bottom of your avatar cylinder, it's defined by the range, all right? If, if, you, if you have one meter before you collide something, well then that defines a cylinder about you that's as tall as 1.6 meters or however high you set that. And so this is uh, what's being collision tested against the geometry in the walk mode. Okay, uh, next pattern on collision. If you think about it, if we're trying to test viewer collision with geometry, that can get quite complicated. Uh, just because we're comparing polygon intersections. All, right, all the geometry is polygonal. All of it's lots of little triangles. Except for our camera, our camera is just a point and a radius, so at least that test is pretty simple. But if there's lots of polygons, even that point and radius, which in effect is a cylinder, which can be a number of polygons, that's a lot of polygons to test. Okay. Now the formulas for polygonal intersection are pretty straightforward. Uh, uh, you're just comparing a triangle and another triangle, and there's, a, there's actually a closed form formula that will let you tell in, in about, I don't know, it's probably uh, 10 or 15 floating point computations. It's that. But if you have a thousand polygons or 10,000 polygons wh where you're trying to compute that, it starts adding up. And if you're trying to compute the 10,000 polygons every single frame, meaning 10 times a second, 20 times a second, it's suddenly going to start chewing up a lot of your uh, computation time because that consumes processing cycles. And then you see this, you see the effect of this by frame rate going down because it takes it longer to compute the collision every time. Say, okay, I've decided whether you've collided or not. Now, I'm, now I can tell you, did you move forward or not? Now I'm ready to finally draw the picture on the screen. Okay, so we like 3D to be peppy and fast, 
we want it to move quickly. So a very important optimization technique for collision is to say, well, maybe I don't want to check 10,000 polygons. Maybe I don't need to check 10,000 polygons. Maybe I could just check a box or a cylinder or, or something simpler, an ellipse possibly. Ellipsoid, let's say. Usually your primitives are best. If you could get away with a box, that's the simplest because then it's only six quadrilaterals or ten or twelve triangles in a box. Uh, you might even get away with uh, a single triangle. Oh, well, that would be the simplest. So how do we do this? What we can do is give a child under the collision field what's called a proxy. And that proxy says, draw all the other children, don't draw me, but I am the proxy. I am the substitute geometry for all that other stuff. So if, if we're trying to detect whether uh, our camera has collided with a 10,000 polygon humanoid, let's not check all those points and vertices. Instead, well, let's give it a box around the humanoid or maybe a cylinder around the humanoid and only check those. So you can see the syntax right here in this example. Our collision node, first of all, is enabled. And then next we put the proxy. And then finally, we put the children. In this case, I just did an inline. But it might be yet another transform, yet another grouping node, yet more shapes, geometry, so on and so forth. OK, so the key one in here is this guy, the proxy. And notice how we label this a proxy. We don't have a proxy node. We have a thing called container field. And we just put that label in there, and it says proxy. So this is uh, the derivation, the history of container field comes from how did we use this thing in uh, Verbal 97. And it's really a, uh, a field name. So let's pull up the editor and see how that works. Okay, collision node example. Okay, and here's our node. And let's edit the collision, take a look at that. And we can see that the collision node, like a lot of the other grouping nodes, is quite simple in and of itself. It just has an enabled to turn it on and off and uh, collide time. And in fact, that might be a mistake there. Yeah, collide time is an output only meaning that you can't set it, it's just the time it occurs. So, so Rich, another thing for the notes there is uh, remove collide time from the collision interface. Okay, but we do see uh, there's a, a container field editor, so let's look at that. Here's a good example of uh, inside the tank or outside the tank, this guy is very big, if we wanted to put in a proxy node, we would put it immediately beforehand. And let's do that. So I'm going to pull up my geometry and let's stick a shape in there. Because we can't just stick in a cylinder by itself, right? It has to have a shape as a parent. So you want a shape? Yes, I want a shape. Stick it in right there. And it can't, and it can't be. Uh, we don't. We don't want it to draw because it's a proxy. 
so it won't draw, so we don't really need an appearance. So let's get rid of that. Oops, I went one step too far. No, I didn't. Uh, we st I'll get rid of the appearance, but now we still need to add our geometry. So I'm going to go even simpler than a cylinder. I'll put a box in. Okay, and uh, let's imagine, if we will, that the kelp forest is uh, 20 by 20 by 20. That's a good approximation. So this would keep us out of there. So we've added a geometry node. We can get rid of the comment. And then we'll be ready to set in container field. Okay, so I'm going to edit the shape node. So we can take advantage of the interface for this. And Jeff, we really do have to check this thing out. I think it must have to do with the recording of the file size. Maybe when it gets too big, we might want we might end up submitting a uh, bug report to the video recording software company. But uh, ordinarily, this is quite peppy. And I know it's it's not my machine because I well I think it's not my machine because I rebooted right before class. But we'll see. Every day a little different. So what I first do to get a uh, container field then is click on the uh, children, excuse me, click on this enable box right here. Let's mark that guy, that enable box. And then uh, what we're going to do there is it's not giving us another choice other than the default, so we'll just type it in. So we want this guy to be a proxy. Say OK, and there it is. Shape container field equals proxy. Let's go back to the slides. Shape container field equals proxy. We replicated that. And we put in a box instead of a cylinder. Okay, so I think we're done. Uh, uh, hints and warnings. Uh, uh, it's very similar to how, uh, uh, or actually, this only works in uh, walk and fly mode because that's when you're navigating around and you might bang into something. And uh, another gotcha is that we don't do collision checks against points or lines. We'll learn how to draw each of those later. Uh, we also don't do collision against text because text can have so many uh, polygons in it for different fonts. It gets kind of unpredictable. But if we use that same transparent box around the text, then that's how we would regain the ability to, to collide with it to block the camera from going through it. So if you navigate through this scene, if you make sure it's on, then you can try zooming into the glass and through the glass and depending on whether the collision node is set or not, if it's false, you can go right through the glass on the kelp forest tank. If it's true, then you're blocked, collision is enabled, and you get stuck there against the glass wall. What's the right behavior? Depends on your model. Depends on what are you trying to achieve with your users. You know, if you think glass should block it and that you actually only want them to go in from a certain way so that they see the inside properly, you might well block the glass and the walls from, from, by collision so that they can't be maneuvered around. Okay, and then uh, we've got some more screenshots here where you can uh, zoom in and try to get close to the Nancy uh, scuba diver or not, reinforcing it. Finally, we have the tooltips, and I think we're done. So let's review then.
actually we'll review right at the end. We finish up this chapter with our, uh, our usual extra resources, uh, some things, uh, some features in NetBeans such as formatting, how can you clean up your, your text to look a little cleaner. Uh, I'll cover this, uh, I guess, in the next lesson. There's some, not one, but now two pretty print to HTML features. You would use this if you want documentation or maybe you're working on your model and you want to scribble on it. This would be a good way to do it. Here's the novology for launching that guy. There's also a menu item for it to make it even easier. And here are examples of what it looks like right here pretty print with the cross links. Okay, so summing up, we looked over bindable nodes, our two most prominent are viewpoint and nav info, and then more nodes dealing with navigation are anchor, billboard, and collision, ABC. Here are the exercises we suggest you do. Uh, screen snapshots can help document. Sometimes you do that in a web page too if you want to show people what's in there. And then finally, our references, uh, as usual, going over to uh, the Vermal source book and looking at their uh, excellent examples uh, is a good idea. In this case, you'd want to go to chapter 26. And that finishes off chapter four. Right. See you next time.